Hello, I'm Marty Pospisil and welcome to my August 2022 market update. There's been a lot of changes in our market, so let's jump right into it. I got a lot of data to share with you today. So firstly, I just want to reiterate the um, metric I use to track the market activity is the sales ratio. And all the sales ratio is, is the absorption rate of product into the market, how quickly things are selling. Um, so if less than 11% of a given product is selling in a given month, it is a buyer's market. It's favoring the buyers and prices are falling. If the absorption rate is between 12 and 20%, we're in a balanced market. It's not favoring the buyers or the sellers, it's balanced. But if more than 21% of the current inventory is selling, we're in what we call a seller's market. There's upward pressure on pricing, bidding wars. It's a very active market. We call that, again, a seller's market. So let's jump right into the data. First, let's watch our market speedo video shooting onto the beach here, just reflecting our overall Vancouver sales ratio. Um, where are we at in general um, for that greater Vancouver area? Uh, and as you can see, um, we are now at 18%. So we've dropped from a seller's market overall for all product for general Vancouver, um, from a seller's market down into a balanced market. And let's look more specifically um, at my table of what's happening with each product category for Metro Vancouver. So for detached houses, the sales activity year over year is down 50%. That's a big drop in activity from this time last year. The benchmark price is still up overall 11% from this time last year for detached houses. And last month, prices dropped 2.8%. So we're starting to see an increase in the steepness of that price drop uh, month over month. Attached townhomes and duplexes, we had reduced activity from last year of 50% as well. We had a price increase from this time last year of 16%. And last month, prices fell 1.7% for attached townhomes and half duplexes. For condo apartments, we had a 36% year-over-year drop in activity. Prices are up 11%. And last month, for the first time, we had a drop of 1.5%. So some really interesting changes in our market. Let's see what's hot and what's not. So again, remember our ratios, less than 11, buyer's market 12 to 20, balanced and over 21, we're in a seller's market. And let's look at each product. Let's look at detached houses first, west side. You can see um, from the past seven months, uh, April was our peak month in a seller's market on the west side for houses at 21%. Where are we now? We're actually at 7%. It dropped further from 10% last month down to 7%. Um, we are now in a buyer's market for detached houses west side. Uh, let's go into the next category, condos and townhomes west side. Uh, our peak again, we had extremely active market back in March and April, peaking at 56% sales ratio. Last month, we had 24% sales ratio, still in a seller's market. This month, we are at 22%. So we are still in a seller's market for condo townhomes um, on the west side. And that is a seller's market. So popping into condos, townhomes, downtown, I separate that, that out because that is a different category. We peaked out at 42% in April. Last month, we had 21% just in that seller's market. And this month, we are at 17%. So that product has now dropped into a balanced market. So. Onward and upward, we'll pop into the east side, detached houses, Vancouver east side, which was extremely active over the last couple of years. In April, we had a 40% sales ratio. That dropped quite dramatically to last month at 14% balanced market. This month, we are at 10%. So we have now dropped into a buyer's market for detached houses on the east side. 
looking at condos and townhomes in the east side. If you remember last uh, April, we had a sales ratio of 75%, super, super active market. Last month, we were at 36%, still a very strong seller's market. This month, we are at 27%, still in a seller's market for condos, townhomes on the east side. So quite interesting. Let's look at the burbs, what's happening all around us in the lower mainland. You can see by the red arrows and the sales ratios in all our suburbs, um, we have um, pretty well uh, uh, sales ratio dropping in every category. A little bit of an upswing in Port Moody for detached, attached, every single suburb is dropping in the sales ratio. So this is not just happening in Vancouver, it's throughout the lower mainland and it's hitting all product categories. And you can see that sales ratio here for detached into that buyer's market and for attached and condos, you can see that steep decline as well. So it is dropping overall. Um, let's look at some forecasting. What's happening today's market drivers? We got market enhancers in green, market deterrence in red. Of course, the big market enhancer is the inventory levels. We are still at a 30 year historic low for inventory levels. There's no sharp increases in listings and you'll actually see in Vancouver, we're seeing just a marginal decline on listings. So until that listing inventory changes, that is a market enhancer and that is propping the prices up because it's all about supply and demand, keeping that pricing. Pent up savings. Remember I mentioned last time, uh, Canadians saved 363 billion dollars in the bank over the pandemic, not traveling, not eating out, etc. Uh, they spent a lot of that, they're still spending, except this might change relatively soon as the consumer confidence drops because people are a little bit worried about the economy. So pent up savings, still a market enhancer. Consumer confidence is now down. You'll see the graph a little bit later in my presentation, the market softening, people are worried about inflation interest rates, the economy. So consumer confidence, both business and personal is dropping. And of course the cost of borrowing, the big market deterrent right now, mortgage rates continue to rise. There's <clears throat> the Bank of Canada has no choice uh, but to tighten the fiscal policy to try and keep inflation out of control. And you'll see some charts later that will blow your mind of what's happening with inflation. You're reading about it in the paper. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, consumer confidence is dropping and you'll see here the business and consumer confidence is falling now both at about the same rate the pre-covid baseline even the business confidence is is, is touching that now so um, there's real concern about our economy tourism you can see we were at our peak level in april and may uh, we are getting people in town just go down to granville island you'll see exactly what i'm talking about it's packed. There are people riding bikes everywhere. Great to see. It's really, really good to see. So tourism is bringing money into the province. That's a positive thing. Um, employment is actually very good. The unemployment, um, uh, the employment levels for all wage tiers is back up. And you can see in BC now we're at 4.6%. Now, this is really interesting because the question is, are we in a recession? And if our economy contracts for two quarters, which it has, technically we are in a recession, but if unemployment is low uh, and there's jobs, we're not really in a recession. So this is why you're getting all this different information out there because there's no real technical uh, definition of a recession besides the two quarter in the economy contracting. So that's really interesting. Unemployment still very low and looks like it's going to stay that way. So um, we've also got that pent up savings that people have a lot of money uh, that they are spending uh, and that's helping the economy. Here's something I like to look at. Housing starts are really good barometer of consumer confidence as builders won't be building things if things are looking uncertain. We're down 3,584 building starts year over year. That's a really good precursor to the confidence 
of builders and developers out there, and you probably read in the Globe last week about a Toronto developer um, canceling 10,000 condo unit pre-sales that they had. That's what's happening. When the builders aren't buying land and starting, starting new homes or towers, et cetera, that shows that we might be into this for a little bit longer term than we hoped. Uh, and of course, I made this emoji even bigger because the cost of borrowing is the big one that had an immediate impact on our market. So let's look at the CPI. So the uh, price index, again, changes in price is experienced by Canadian consumers. It me measures the price change um, by comparing through time the cost of a fixed basket of goods. So it's the fastest growth rate since 1983. And that's what's driving inflation. And there are eight major areas we look at. We look at food, shelter, household operations, uh, furnishing, equipment, clothing, transportation, health, and personal care. There's various categories that they track to determine the consumer price index. Um, one of the things, of course, is, is the cost of housing and rental trends. Um, as you remember last month, I noted it's at 2016 for an unfurnished one bedroom. That's jumped again, and today it's $2,031 on average to rent an unfurnished one bedroom in Vancouver. So you can see that's just one cost that's gone up dramatically. And here are all the others. You can see there's been an increase um, in prices for the consumer, and it rose 8.1% on a year over year average, up from 7.7% last month. This is the fastest growth since 1983. So things are getting expensive, and why? Because inflation is, and that's reflecting, of course, inflation. We're at 8.1% now. The US is at 9.1%. Incredible, that's the highest it's been in four decades. So while the consumer price index measures price changes, inflation is really the cost of living. Um, and too much inflation or too little inflation can create problems. And the ideal level of inflation determined by the US and, and Canadian governments has been 2% per year. And it's been determined that that's ideal rate to attain the main goal of protecting consumer prices, uh, keeping it stable, and maximizing employment. So we're nowhere near that 2% right now. We're at 8.1, 9.1, and what the government does to try and bring that down, the only tool really they have is to tighten their fiscal policy and increase interest rates to deter spending, and that should have some impact on inflation. However, there are other factors. So. Just for fun, let's look at some record international inflation rates. So what I did is I pulled up the top 10 countries with the highest inflation. Venezuela has 1,198% inflation. So what that means, something that cost, um, uh, uh, say for example, a gasoline cost $2 a liter last year, this year, it will cost $26 a liter, 13 times what it would have cost last year. That's 1,200% inflation. Here we are complaining about 8.1. 340% in Sudan, Lebanon is 200%. Um, incredible, I don't know how they do it. What happens? You're shopping, your shopping bill last year was $100 to go shop at Choices, and then this year, it's $1,300 per week. What do you do? Incredible, I, I found these numbers fascinating. And of course, the lowest inflation, Rwanda has minus 2%, Chad is minus 0.5%, um, and you can go all the way down to Saudi Arabia, all the way up to Saudi Arabia at 1.1%. So there's many countries out there that have very, very low inflation, also not that good. You don't wanna be too high, you don't wanna be too low. Again, about 2% is perfect, but I digress on inflation. So there's a 25 year historical inflation. You can see it's jumped incredibly just since the onset of the pandemic. You can see how low it was when the pandemic hit and inflation has been growing dramatically 
for that period of time. So why such high inflation? Well, interest rates have been far too low for far too long. Um, generous um, pandemic fiscal stimulus in the US and Canada has fueled inflation. An unprecedented increase in the demand for goods could not be matched by the supply, brought the consumer price index up. And in fact, almost 2.3% of Canada's inflation rate can be attributed to the US fiscal policy of spending over the pandemic. So we're getting that overflow of all that money that was given out over the pandemic, not only here in Canada, but in the US, and that's also causing that inflation. Really interesting stuff. So, of course, what all this means is the mortgage rates are going up, back to how it's impacting our real estate market. And as the mortgage rates are increasing because they have to, because the, the uh, rates are needed to increase to keep inflation in check, you can see the projection for the rest of this year keeps going up. Now, it's really interesting because interest rates are the only tool really that our government has. There's other tools, but that's the main one. But that's not going to ease inflation on its own until the easing of the supply chain troubles go and get in check and lower energy prices, which we know is not happening. Um, and number three, we need a cooling of the US economy to something that's a little bit more sustainable. So until those three things get in check, uh, we're not gonna see any change in inflation or in interest rates. So that's very interesting. Now, Bearing that in mind, thinking of our brothers in the Ukraine, the inflation rate there is at 30% uh, and interest rates are at 25% uh, and the, almost a third of their workforce is unemployed. Not surprising they're in a war, but whatever we're facing, there's people in the world that are in a much, much rougher shape. Uh, and, and it's kind of nice to, to bear that in mind as we're going through this. So mortgage rates getting a little bit out of control. We're probably going to see some more jumps. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Inventory levels. Now, inventory levels, as you can see, it's the yellow line. We're seeing a little bit of an increase overall in BC. Again, in Vancouver, it's been pretty steady. It hasn't increased dramatically yet. That's been our one um, market supporter as those in inventory levels are keeping low. On the west side in particular, you can see for houses, that's actually decreased a little bit over the last month. Um, and on attached condos and townhomes, we also had a little bit of a decrease in inventory. People are not listing right now yet. Um, maybe that will happen. It's one of the factors we're watching. But if you look at prices overall for product, you can see the blue line being detached houses. Our peak was back in March, April and house prices have been falling. You can see we're now falling on average in all product categories two to three percent per month and townhomes of course you can see peaked at the same time and is falling in condos as well so that's reflected in the average price graph um, since 1977 uh, again back here in 80 81 82 you can see that's when interest rates were at 20 21 22 percent I was around then. I remember how crazy that was. Can you imagine if interest rates were at 22% today um, and you're renewing and your old rate was 2%? Impossible. It'd be, it'd be mayhem. People would be throwing keys at the bank door. Um, so that's kind of interesting, all relative. Um, let's talk about forecasting. Uh, what are we watching? This is the Vancouver Housing Price Index since, uh, what are we going back to September of 2021? And you can see our peak here was back in March and April of the Vancouver Housing Price Index. We've had the Housing Price Index drop significantly. Uh, and uh, since that, that period, we've had that drop. The determining factors that, of course, we are watching is interest rates, uh, the cooling off periods. These are all negative uh, things that are impacting our market. Uh, you're paying taxes if you're selling a home under a year. Consumer confidence is down. Now, the, a few things, the determining factors that have not been initiated yet is the listing inventory surge. That's the only thing keeping our pricing moderately dropping when that once that takes place you're going to see prices drop quite significantly 
Uh, the federal government has not banned blind bidding, and they have not done the election platform promise of the two-year ban on foreign home buyers. So these are all the things we're watching, the determining factors for our market. We are, of course, in a falling market. We don't know how far it's going to fall, but it looks like it's going to continue uh, for some time uh, before we see that market stabilize. So here's what you're reading in the paper. There's been predictions of 10 to 20 to 30, and in some cases, um, historic uh, corrections from the report recently out from RBC of what we're expecting to come in our real estate market. So um, the media is certainly having an impact. So we're in a post-pandemic economy. Now, that's kind of an interesting term because we're still in the pandemic, kind of, or is it endemic? That's a whole other discussion. Uh, but that post-pandemic uh, economy, as they're calling it, there's lots of jobs out there. In fact, restaurants can't find people to work. They're, the mid to entry level jobs is not enough people um, filling them. So there's lots of jobs. There's low unemployment, but the supply chain issues continue. That's keeping inflation up. And energy costs are actually increasing thanks to the war in the Ukraine. That's not helping. So inflation is soaring. So it's a really interesting time we're in. For all intents and purposes, since the economy has contracted for two quarters, we're technically in a recession, um, but the record low unemployment is counteracting that. So are we really in the recession, as I mentioned earlier? Um, so buyers, for buyers, the fear of missing out, which we dealt with this spring has been replaced with the fear of buying in a falling market. So buyers are being a little cautious. Um, should I be buying now? Will this home be cheaper next month or the month after that? Uh, and that's the mentality of the buyer right now. For sellers, they're deciding whether to wait it out or sell now and cut their losses. Um, and everybody's trying to figure out how long will this last? When are we going to stabilize and when will prices come back? And that is, of course, impacted by inflation, the economy, a hundred of other, hundred other factors. Um, uh, and to help us with that, if you recall, there was an announcement uh, made by the Bank of Canada governor, um, Tiff Macklem, and he actually said the Bank of Canada now expects inflation to average around 8% for the next few months and then fall to around 3% by the end of 2023, but not get back to our target of 2% until 2024. So the Bank of Canada is saying, look, this is gonna continue for a while, which might mean our prices might continue to soften for a while. So it's quite interesting time we're in right now. However, we're entering a fantastic time for some People. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a really good window right now for upgrade buyers. I could tell you story after story of clients right now who are upgrading from their condos to their first house because that marginal upgrade cost is lower than ever. Houses are dropping more dollar-wise than condos. So jumping up now is a great time. So we're getting people making that jump. And also it's a great time for cash-rich investors. If you're not borrowing at these high rates and you've got money set aside, what a great time to invest in real estate and build that portfolio. Or even go variable open and ride this storm out until the rates do come back down, because they will. If they don't, we're in for much worse time than we, than we thought, but I, they will, um, and they'll come back to normal, and that would be the time to lock it in. So very, very interesting times. Um, let's do a little fun fact I thought you might enjoy seeing. Um, this is a Canada and U.S. urban area's highest population densities per square kilometer. The highest in all of Canada and the U.S. is Toronto. Now, you're saying, holy cow, why is New York way down there? Isn't New York the highest? Well, Toronto's number one, Los Angeles is number two, and Calgary? What? What's going on? Calgary is ahead of New York? This doesn't make any sense. Well, the reason for it is the urban area in this graph. This is like the built-up area around a major city. So when you're up in a plane and you see all of those lights around the city, 
that's the urban area, not necessarily Manhattan, which of course would be the most dense. We're talking about the whole city of New York. So um, I thought that was kind of a fun fact to throw in there. Um, that's my August 2022 market update. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube page or like us on Facebook. Uh, that's all I have to say today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the cooler weather we're getting. It's going to get hot again next week and have a great, great rest of the month.